Om Ajnati Mirandhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshu Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Shreshtam Manum Api Shachiputra Matra Swarupam Rupam Tasyagajam Urupurin Maturin Goshtavartin Radha Kundam Girivaramaho Radhika Matavasham Prapto Yasya Pratita Kripaya Shri Gurum Tambatos Bandeham Shri Guru Shri Ataf Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavas Chashi Rupam Sagraja Tam Sahagana Raghuna Tam Vitam Tam Saj Sadvaitam Sabad Hutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Titanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishaka Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Okay, fire away. I'm at your disposal. I'm your servant. Not very good servant, but... Oh, Maharaj, thank you very much, first of all, for joining today, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. It's been uh, my very fond aspiration to have your association <laughs> I started the Monk's podcast about one and a half years ago. And since the early days of my Krishna consciousness, I was always very inspired by your thought provoking and of course, sometimes provoking classes. One of the reasons I started the Monk's podcast was that we often on the Vyasasan, we can certain topics are spoken, but there are many other topics that are important for devotees uh, discussion for understanding. And those topics could be discussed over here. So, you know, I especially have appreciated mm. many of your books. But here, one of my inspirations to actually start take writing up as a serious service. In you really life. have done. You've done a lot of writing. Yeah, I tried to do some things uh, by Krishna's mercy, and your Bhakti Siddhant Vaibhav was an immense inspiration for me. To three things actually, among many that, first of all, just the sheer amount of effort you had put in in comprehensively documenting. Bhaktisana Sutakur's life, also the level of uh, vocabulary and scholarship and analysis that had gone into that book and the broadening of the understanding of the Gaudiya Sampraday that uh, not just in terms of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Chaitanya Lila, but in terms of recent history. So I found that mm. book very, very illuminating personally. Mm. And I also had the fortune to uh, be of some service to you in some of your books, especially the Balram book. And which is still in the womb. It's <laughs> Balaram's still in the womb. It's a long pregnancy. <laughs> That's beautiful. There, was a, put <laughs> there was a miscarriage and it entered the womb of Kishore Prabhu, who's he, he's attached to Balaram and won't let him go. <laughs> okay. You don't understand. It's it's cryptic language. <laughs> no, but it's a quick, I mean a, it's a very sharp and pertinent metaphor of Long pregnancy and miscarriage. <laughs> it's brilliant correlation. Because because uh, Balaram, he was in, he went from the womb of Devaki to Rohini by apparent miscarriage, and you know, you know. Yes, my yeah, That's true. About this point of broadening the perspective about the sampradaya, there's still huge amount of work to do on that. Um, some devotee scholars are doing that, as you know, no doubt you're connected with the academic side of ISKCON. Yes, ma'am. Um, and they're, they're mostly looking at the history and the, uh, the... I just saw there's one of your godbrothers at Oxford brought out a, a thesis on the political undercurrents at the time of Dalade Vidya Bhushan and how that affected... How it appeared... I haven't read it, but how it appeared to have affected their... Uh, their philosophy or their presentation of Krishna consciousness, which is quite amazing if you think about it. The, the social, the social ramific, well, that's what we're going to talk about. But another thing, um, really, just like Srila Prabhupada said, if you want to know me, read my books. Mm -hmm. So really to understand the previous Acharyas, you really have to go deeply into their teachings. Yes, Maharaj. 
uh, for that, you need to know Sanskrit very well and, and Nyai and Mimangsa and so many things. And of course, for 99.99% of us, everything we need to know is in Srila Prabhupada's books. Yes, my Anyway, please go on, because we, we didn't even get started yet. Yes. But we could say so many things even before we get started. So, yeah, please. Yes, my Thank you. So I thought that uh, today we could discuss on this topic of continuity and change within the tradition because you have studied Prabhupada very deeply. You have written several books on Jai Prabhupada and other books about and appreciating Prabhupada, speaking strongly in Prabhupada's service. And then you have written also about Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur. So I, I'm please... also working, just to interrupt you, which I shouldn't yeah. do, but I'm doing it. I'm also working on a, a big book. It'll be about a thousand pages, about just an overview of everything Srila Prabhupada did, and how he did it and uh, so that's quite a big thing that's going to be bigger than all the works i've done on srila Prabhupada so far all of them put together oh is this the book on the mood and mission of srila Prabhupada? That yeah, yeah. yeah 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 okay. yeah maybe i'll discuss it with you some more after we've finished this talk yes ma'am. because exactly. it's uh, it's going along but slowly anyway we can discuss yes, that afterwards but that's going to be a very important book Yes, Manaj. So, um, yeah. So, uh, in one Continuity. sense, because these two are the most prominent recent Acharyas we have, Shri Prabhupada and Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur. So, the, the dynamism of, the, of the, how the tradition works, I thought we could discuss that based on looking at their teachings and their presentation of Krishna consciousness. Yeah. At one level, Prabhupada did say that, I'm simply like a postman. I didn't change anything. I just spoke my spiritual master's message. And at the same time, Prabhupada encountered a di very different socio-cultural reality, especially in the West. So he did have to adapt to present the things. So I have thought of maybe four or five points where there are seeming differences in Prabhupada's approach or emphasis. So mm -hmm. we could take them one by one and discuss the dynamism of continuity and change in the Gaudiya tradition with a focus on Prabhupada and Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur. If that's okay. okay. Yeah, definitely it's okay. Um, before we get into discussing that, I'd just like to talk a little bit about the importance of this topic. It can be taken simply as an intellectual exercise, and there are scholars who do that, not only in the religious field. They study the, for instance, in Marxism, the different strands of Marxism, um, and it is possible to be a scholar of religion and not actually believe or be committed, but just you just study it, just like some people study butterflies and some people study atomic reactions and some people study religionists and they just study it, but they're not really, they're not committed to it. But for us, it's important to see about this, this preservation and continuity, because we are in the process. Yes, when we say we are in the parampara, uh, I just read something that Jayadvaita Maharaj quoted from Kripa Moi Prabhu, saying that about Prabhupada disciples, it's very important. That he said, we, we don't realize that others are looking at us, and what we do will set for future generations how they understand Prabhupada, what we do, mm -hmm. how we interpret it. So it is important. We're, we're engaged in something which is of such tremendous importance. I, 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 it's difficult for us to gauge how important what we're doing. The, the Supreme Personality of Godhead comes down as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and showers his mercy on the world. And here we all are. And we are the ones, for better or for worse, who are carrying that forward. And we have our massive acharyas. We're talking here particularly about Srila Bhakti Sansar Thakur and our own Srila Prabhupada, just massive figures who made it, who literally altered the the course of religious history and the made religious history. And we are the ones who are in charge with 
carrying that message forward. And just like you're saying that the Srila Prabhupada faced a different socio socio-cultural milieu than that of Bhakti Siddhanta Sraktaku. Well, so do we, because the world is changing mm. so much all the time. Of course, there's always birth, death, old age, and disease. But uh in the in the Western world, the influence of feminism has been has tremendously changed people people's outlook. And even Men, I would say nowadays, are much more, just by cultural pressure, uh, uh, they have to be very sensitive and all this kind of thing. <laughs> Touchy yes, feeling, ma'am. that's one way of putting it, or microaggression is another. Yeah, that is true. So, so the way Srila Prabhupada preached was so strong. And it was quite amazing that he largely got away with it even at that time. I mean, we didn't find people uh, just like he went on TV and this and that, and he was very forthright. But uh, we we do find a very different way. So that that's a big question. I mean, that's a major question facing our moment, isn't it? Gender issues. I'm getting questions from America. How how do we deal with people who are serious about Krishna consciousness, but they're transgender? Yes, it's, it's something outside of my experience, and it. And I see, yeah, so the, anyway, yeah. the world has, there are significant changes in the world, and, and people want to know about this, right? That is What's very your true. attitude towards tran- transgender people? Yeah, in fact, and uh, yeah, go on. So, in fact, uh, for many, especially liberal minded people, the attitude toward these kind of issues is like a litmus test for them to the, how they decide what kind of organization you are. Yeah. Now, so that becomes very problematic. So in one sense, our discussion is not just about the past. From the past, we want to get some guidelines to deal with the present and the future. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I'm saying. That's why this discussion, it's not just some kind of academic discussion between us, but we we have to carry that forward into, into the present and into the future. But another thing is that we, without any insult to yourself, but we, you and I, and so many others, it's absolutely safe to say we're just not on the level of Srila Prabhupada or Bhaktisthan Sarsrak Thakur. Of course. And uh, even Prabhupada himself said, in America, I was experimenting. He was trying mm-hmm. things out. And one example we can see of that, he, was, he, was, he got couples married. Hmm. And just said, okay, you marry overnight. He said, tomorrow you're going to marry this one. Tomorrow you're going to marry this one. And he expected it to work out on the basis of Krishna consciousness, but it didn't. Yeah. So if even Srila Prabhupada was experimenting, it, it, what, what's our position? On the one hand, we can't, we have to, pre, we're talking about preserving the principles, preserving the yeah. essence. But, uh, and uh, like you said, people, the litmus test, they won't even, they won't even give us the time of day. We're just a closed book to them if they think that we don't accept their ideas of gender equality or transgenderism and all this kind of thing. Yeah. But our, phil- our, phil- well, our philosophical teachings, look at the books of Srila Prabhupada, which is, we're distributing. They're, they're not, they disagree with that very strongly. So mm-hmm. these are real issues <laughs> and they're yeah. not easy ones. Yes, but sir. at the same time, yeah, at the same time, we have great acharyas and we have ourselves and we have the, we have the mandate to carry it on. So uh, yes, you know, we can simply pray. We can look at the, We can look at their example and try to understand. Uh, that's another thing. It's very difficult to understand actually everything. Everything that they did and why they did it. Vaishnava era kriya mudra vigeha nabhu joy. So that's another thing. Yes, ma'am. I must say, in, in, uh, now I'm making for, for the last few years uh, 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 what could be called a deep study of Srila Prabhupada and what he did and everything. I, some things I find that, that I would have just accepted. It's you could say intellectually some things I don't understand when I start to go deeper. 
So there we oh. go. So you are saying as you study more, some things which would have been, which were acceptable earlier are there is. Well, when now? I when I think about it, I, I I'll just okay. give you one example. Um, he's not very well known in our movement nowadays. Siddha Swarupananda. Yes. He was for years and years. Srila Prabhupada, you could say, tolerated him and encouraged him, while the rest of Srila Prabhupada's disciples were very strongly against Siddha Swarupananda. He was causing a lot of trouble to what you might call the regular ISKCON, but Prabhupada went on encouraging him. But then it, sometimes this is a Swarupananda's face, and definitely to uh, Burijan Prabhu, he was very strong in condemning him, but he went on encouraging him. On the other hand, there was there were uh, Kanu Priya and Jamadagni in Los Angeles who who asked Srila Prabhupada some very pointed questions, but very pertinent questions. Just like you, you must have seen this conversation. They were asking questions like, um, well, how do we explain that Maharaj Ugra Sena had seven billion bodyguards, which is more than the population of the world at the time? Yeah. It seems how do you explain and, and it seems to me like a very pertinent question. But Prabhupada didn't want to deal with he, he didn't want to deal with them. I, it seems to me because he perceived that they were somewhat defiant of him. But yeah. and so in that conversation, yeah, Prabhupada also seems to consider that issue not very consequential. He says that among thousands of verses of the Bhagavatam, why focus on that particular thing, especially when dealing with scholars? So, but 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 they said that well, we're giving these books to to intelligent people, they're going to ask us these questions, what do we say? Yeah. And it seems to me to be a very pertinent question, but Srila Prabhupada, and then they also said that so-and-so approached me homosexually, and Prabhupada also just, he, he seemed a bit disturbed by it, but he just also just brushed that aside, so to speak. He just didn't, do, he didn't want to deal with them. And uh, of course, Srila Prabhupada has the full prerogative to do that, and it seems he didn't like their attitude in mm. asking. But at the same time, the questions are very pertinent. The questions themselves are very pertinent. Yes. So like that. Um, yes, Maharaj, that is true. So, you know, before we wade into territory that <laughs> is like very controversial in today's terms, if we just look back at Prabhupada and Bhaktisam Sri Thakur, so broadly... I uh, from so people have asked some devotees and devotee academics and even some academic scholars have asked me these questions about how do we reconcile some differences in Prabhupada's uh, stress, focus, strategy, or style as compared to Bhaktisan Sri Thakur's. So one explanation, of course, is the different circumstance. Now, one thing which seems very striking is Prabhupada's vocabulary was much more accessible than Bhaktisan Sri Thakur's vocabulary. And it also, to some extent, at least, it seems that uh, in the early BTG articles, Prabhupada used a little more uh, more vocabulary that was similar to Bhaktisam Sri Thakur's. But later on, he started using a little, or at least in his purports and many of his uh, other books, the vocabulary seems to be more accessible. So do you have any idea with, did you notice this or or how do you see this difference in vocabulary, basically? Okay, okay, okay. Before... We're getting into the uh, the meat, you could say, of the discussion now. But if if you agree, I'll read out. I have a three pages from my Mood and Mission book. Okay, please, Maharaj. Okay, I'm going to read a chapter called Different and Non-Different from His Guru. It'll take about 10 minutes, I guess, to read. Okay. And you can interrupt me at any time. Uh, in 1958... Abhai Charanaravind the Das described his spiritual master in words that later became undeniably applicable to himself also. So please listen to this, understanding that it's Srila Prabhupada describing his own guru, but this, the same words can be used to describe Srila Prabhupada also. Hmm. So Srila Prabhupada wrote, you preached the pure philosophy of Lord Gauranga in such a way that intelligent persons could understand. 
and you so and you showed such great concern, O Master, in convincing all your adversaries. Lord Gauranga used many tricks just to engage the conditioned souls in devotional service. That's very relevant to our whole discussion today, isn't it? Yes, that's true. Lord Gauranga used many tricks just to engage the conditioned souls in devotional service, and you have also understood how to use all those tricks perfectly well. You understood time, place, and circumstance, and utilized everything as a strategy for preaching. End of the quote. In 1976, Srila Prabhupada had the logo of the Gorya Mat, originally designed by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswar Thakur, painted on both pillars of the main entrance gate at ISKCON's world headquarters in Mayapur, which is, of course, the place where there are so many Gorya Mats. Actually, at that time, there was, on, there was only the Sri Chaitanya Mat, Advaita Bhavan, Yoga Pete, Madhav Maharaj's Mat, and Goswami Maharaj's Mat, but later so many others came. Okay. Anyway, Prabhupada had the logo of the, have you seen at the gate of Mayapur, they have on both sides the logo of the Gorya Mat, thus asserting his allegiance to the vision and core concepts of Saraswati Thakur, notwithstanding the several differences in externals that he necessarily instituted in order to make possible the fulfillment of Saraswati Thakur's mission, the establishment of Krishna consciousness worldwide. Like his own guru, Srila Prabhupada was being impelled by intense compassion for the, for the conditioned souls, an aggressive and uncompromising preacher of the absolute truth. So that idea of compassion and aggression, normally are not, they don't consider to go together. Uh, and like his guru, Srila Prabhupada was self-reliant, strong-minded, and with huge plans yet also fully dependent upon and a surrendered follower of his guru. Like his guru, Dave, Srila Prabhupada started his, his mission alone, going against the current of the time with no help and facing opposition even from other Vaishnavas. Hmm. Only by unshakable conviction, tenacity and power of devotion were both gradually able to gather followers and do something unexpected, unimagined, and magnificent for establishing Krishna's glories in the world. Hmm. In unprecedentedly bringing Krishna consciousness to non-Hindus, Srila Prabhupada kept his teachings well grounded in the principles and doctrines of his predecessors in the Gorya Vaishnav tradition. Srila Prabhupada charted the course that all seminal religious teachers must negotiate, that between fidelity to a tradition and relevance to a time and place with consideration of the mentality and aptitude of those he ministered to. That paragraph is taken from uh, something that my god brother Prajumna Prabhu wrote. Very important observation. Okay, continuing what I wrote. There is no reason that Acharyas cannot have different outlooks, approaches, and personalities. Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswara Thakur was known to be very strict and grave. Yet Srila Prabhupada, while not lacking these qualities, was more accommodating and fun-loving, quote-unquote. Okay. Under Srila Prabhupada, and then there's a whole section I have about how Srila Prabhupada made Krishna consciousness fun. For the oh, first, okay. for the newcomers. That's another chapter. Yes, but yes. at the same time, the, the fun was, was the, uh, it was bringing people into the actual bliss of the spiritual world, spiritual, yeah. spiritual fun. So now, when Prabhupada said, I did, you, you have mentioned this point that an, there is no reason why acharya, one Acharya cannot be different from uh, another Acharya in some things. And one different, reason, uh, different outlooks, approaches, and personalities. Yeah. Yes. So now personality, of course, we understand is intrinsic to every individual. Uh, now, when Prabhupada said, I didn't change anything. So how do we understand that? What, does, what did he mean? Was he implicitly referring to like essentials I haven't changed? Yeah, the message is unchanged. Okay. The, the spiritual message. Certain outlooks on social issues may be different. Uh, we see that Bhaktivinoda Thakur, 
he like most of the or from what I understand, most of the Bhadra Lok of Calcutta at that time hmm. was against child marriage, although he himself had child, he was married as a child as he describes, and certain other social issues which came to pass, widow remarriage and but um child marriage, Srila Prabhupada was in favor of it, at least marriage at a very young age. So different outlook on social issues. Okay. So, uh, so when we I, say that I, unchanging, I, what hmm. it means is that the essential message is not changed. And in one sense, by looking at uh, what what are the differences, say, between what Prabhupada has done and Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur has done, or what you can say Prabhupada and Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur did, we can also, that can help us get a sense of what is the what is the core core that is meant to be kept unchanged? What are the principles? And then what has been changed that itself we can see is a indication of something which is a contextual social issue that, that is changeable. Say, for example, let's say position on issue like uh, widow remarriage or uh, like child, uh, child marriage. The fact that two Acharyas have had different positions on that issue indicates that... Uh, this itself is not a central issue to our philosophy. And then that can be, uh, the position can be adjusted accordingly. I don't want to go into the issue mm. specifically. Okay. I try to understand the principle here. Like yeah. there are spiritual teachings and there are social application of the spiritual teachings. So yeah. the social applications may vary. Uh, so would that be a domain for relevance and uh, uh, fidelity, roughly speaking? Well, well here I... I want to bring up a point that Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur was the pioneer of the program for bringing Krishna consciousness to the Western world. That, that's written in the 1972 edition of the Bhagavad Gita as it is, the first Macmillan edition. This picture yeah. of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, the, the pioneer of the program to bring Krishna consciousness to the West. Yeah. Bhaktisan Sasar Thakur came next and our own Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada, he actually did bring it to the West. Srila Prabhupada is the founder Acharya of ISKCON. And therefore, I feel, sorry, I, I shouldn't say I feel because Prabhupada, he, he wanted everything very definite, but we do, it, it's a... We have a society in which there are different opinions about what it means to follow Srila Prabhupada. So I have to say that I have to put it in a relativistic way um, mm -hmm. that Srila Prabhupada had a very specific vision for how he wanted Krishna consciousness to unfold in the future. And that's a lot about what the book I'm writing is about. I'm trying to write it just showing what Prabhupada wanted and not insert myself there. But he did foresee... A, a world civilization based on Varnashram Dharma. So when we're talking about social adjustments that we have to see to adjust to the present situation, but at the same time, keeping Prabhupada's vision of, it's not just that we want to get people to chant Hare Krishna, but we also want to establish on Srila Prabhupada's order, a revival of Varnashram Dharma to make it easier for people to live in Krishna consciousness. That's a very big topic, which I have discussed to some extent in the book that I'm writing. Mm. So um, we could say that, well, we just get people to chant Hare Krishna and follow four regulated principles. But Srila Prabhupada had also, and the social issues we can adjust here and there, but Srila Prabhupada had a very definite uh, social program. How we get from here to there, that we can discuss. But first of all, we should see where we're going. It's not, not just that we're reacting to society. Okay, so, okay, there's gender issues. Okay, how are we going to react to that? And then there's some other issues come up. How are we going to react to that? Mm. Uh, okay. But we, 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 have, we should have our own clear direction of where we're going socially, which is establishing Varnashram Dharma. Okay. So if I understand right, what you are saying, Maharaj, is that because Prabhupada is our founder Acharya, 
even his statements about social issues have a certain uh, significant importance for us and yeah, yeah. and we, even we, when he we wanted to be... spread krishna consciousness yeah. it was it was not we could say just a transcendental program but also a particular social program that he wanted by which to spread krishna consciousness uh, well he he did want to establish varnashram dharma um that was his social vision and we should see that as his social vision and that's not uh divorced from transcendental krishna consciousness uh it's the it's the social system which helps people to be krishna conscious and Srila Prabhupada had this idea, as you know, even before he came to the West. He was very, if you, the early Back to God said that he was talking about this. And uh, it seems there was considerable discussion about this in intellectual circles, shaping the new India, because from yeah. 1947, just suddenly they'd been, for, gener for, for decades, they'd be saying that they want free India and all. It happened quite quickly. They didn't have much time to prepare for it. It happened suddenly that India was independent. The, the British said, okay, you're going to be independent. After the war, a new government was voted in, the Labour government in Britain. They said, okay, India, be independent. And they speeded it up and it just, boom, it happened very quickly. And there was a lot of discussion about various, you know very well that Ambedkar, mm -hmm. especially talking about caste issues and all this. That's true, yeah. Um, but... It seems from what little I've studied, and I haven't gone into this deeply, that even in Bed Ambedkar himself and Mahatma Gandhi, they weren't against the concept of what we would call the Varnashram Dharma. And at that time in India, of course, it in, in many ways it worked. In India at that time, even in the villages, well, even in the town, there, there was... And it's still there. There's the there's the expert artisan community who they know how to each one. The potter knows how to make pots. The carpenter knows mm -hmm. how to make uh, wooden utensils on so many things. And uh, the kayasters, that, that's what they're called in Bengal and Karans in North India. They're expert administrators. And it, oh, and, and to a certain extent it worked, but there was this uh, unnecessary discrimination, which Ambedkar was obviously, he, as is well known, he was very disturbed by that. Hmm. But he, he didn't become a Buddhist overnight. He was trying to work within the framework of Hinduism. Right, okay, within the for framework. For a long time he tried that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So but he wasn't against the idea, but I mean, he, he thought, well, Buddha. Buddha, he kicked it out. I'll join, I'll join the Buddhists. So Srila Prabhupada was talking about Varnashram, but he, he was making the point, and he wasn't the first to do so, either from the spiritual side, um, or, or what shall I say, either, either from the religious, it's difficult because in India, the religious and the secular have always been so mixed, and we don't know that now because we're living in, 21st century secular India, where it seems as if the secular and the religious religious are different, although it wasn't until recently. But uh, there were people whose whose main interest was social. And again, I can give the example of Ambedkar and Gandhi and many others also, hmm. who were not against, who were talking about Varnashram and the caste system, and were saying that it's got to be uh, quality based and not birth based. So it wasn't only Srila Prabhupada who was saying this. And of course, Bhaktivinoda Thakur was saying that, that India has to revive its real Varnashram system and then India can become very strong and lead the world spiritually. So it was a very, it, it was a big topic of discussion hmm. even before Srila Prabhupada came to the West. But the amazing thing was that he wanted to implement that in, even even in the West. That's really revolutionary, especially considering in the West there's so much egalitarian minded. Yes, Maharaj. You know, so, Varnashram well, itself is a, sorry, Varnashram is a huge is a topic. subject. It's a huge subject. Yeah. And uh, why don't we have another talk some other time about it? Yes, that? Maharaj, we could, we could discuss that definitely. So, mm. 
now how do we get there yeah we were talking about trying to understand whether we could understand what are the oh right principles, right, right, principles right. and what are the details based on say prabhupad social positions so you said that we have to be a little cautious about that because prabhupad also did focus on social issues quite strongly i think one in one of our discussions earlier several years ago you had mentioned that prabhupad was among the first acharyas to integrate social commentary in his scriptural commentaries his scriptural Actual commentary logics. is not just a scriptural explication yeah. but he addresses social issues elaborately mm. so uh, if we if we look at prabhupad and we look at bhaktasan sri thakur so you were reading your uh, the extract from your book and i was making this point that Uh, relevance and fidelity if those two things are to be balanced mm. so are there certain things which uh, we can see as uh, significant uh, dif- differences between prabhupad and uh, bhakti sanskrit bhakti sanskrit which can give us some guidelines for principles or some guidelines for how to or what is adjustable and what is not adjustable because if we say starts if we say that prabhupad's social policy is uh, instantiated or is made in stone then that almost becomes like a diversion from the tradition because most of the adaptation will come in social issues only so that means the dynamism of fidelity and uh, and relevance mm-hmm. in one sense after shila prabhupad becomes frozen to zero relevance and absolute fidelity mm-hmm. because we are not going to change the scripture we are not going to ever say that krishna not krishna is not god and shiva is god so the most of the re- relevance will be with respect to social issues and if we mm-hmm. say that prabhupad's social policy is what is going to be forever for iskon then that means basically there is no room for adaptation at all and isn't that itself a difference from the way the tradition has operated uh, yeah but, for centuries but i didn't say that though okay i didn't say <clears throat> i said that we have to keep shila proper social vision okay and work to, but at the same time see where we are and how to get there we might have to go like this can you okay. see me on the screen? we might have to go like this rather than like this hmm. i write in the introduction i wrote that to this book i wrote that it, it, we have to uh we have to keep shila prabhupad's instructions as our guidelines and at the same time not freeze the move, not freeze the movement in time okay so, so it is a big discussion yeah yeah because in one sense for uh, an- another thing if uh, is that we can sit here discussing like we're doing and it is of relevance that we discuss such things of course but at the same time there are so many devotees who are out there doing things not saying that you're not doing anything yeah. which uh in their own way they they are representing prabhupad as they see and they are setting the tone of the krishna conscious movement they're influencing it i'll give one example it's controversial <laughs> sorry <laughs> mahavishnu maharaj my god brother he goes he's over 70 years old he goes out chanting hari naam in public which is great regularly uh he but he has a hat which is considered zany by some or it has all kinds of it has the changing bodies exhibit on it yeah and his he he wears uh, fluorescent green clogs and it's a bit zany and you might say well you shouldn't do that sanyasi shouldn't do that i'm not going to comment on that here now i, I um, but i'm just saying that you can say this should be done this shouldn't be done but in the meantime people are going out into the world and doing things and they are representing prabhupad to others and it's happening it's just like there there was christ and what ex- we have his teach we we think we have his teachings and then there was the church was formed and then 
another church was formed and then another church was formed and the people just, we can say it should be like this, but then at some point in time, someone says, uh, to hell with you, I'm going to start my own church. And they represent Christ to others. So mm. it's not it's not just a matter of intellectually trying to understand it, but what people do also very much influences our approach to Christian consciousness. And I, I yeah, I mentioned that also the, the the tremendous influence of feminism. I would say that's a, that's a big. Can diff- just if we take one point at a time, if you don't mind. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So, that, well, this is to I, this yeah. is to illustrate that point. Yeah, more. I, I I'm not going to talk, talk about feminism per se, yeah. but I'm just going to say that we, you and I, maybe you came a little later to Krishna consciousness. The way we deal with others in Krishna consciousness is also influenced, I would say, by um, the whole world, the Western world is very much influenced by uh, being very sensitive to others. Maybe that's a good thing. Probably it is uh, to some extent. But I'm just saying that in the early days, we were probably far too rough, <laughs> but we were very direct in our dealings. Yes. And it, it could be tough, but nowadays we're very careful how we deal with others. And I would say that that's a, uh, that's a, that's a reaction or, or we're just influenced by the way the whole social milieu is. We are, whether we know it or not, Okay. influenced by it. Okay, that's a lot of stuff. Over to you. Thank you, Arash. Um, so I, I appreciate this point that ultimately uh, any tradition is, is shaped by people who are actually living it. So there are different mm. people who will live it in different ways and people will associate that with the tradition. I don't think ever in the tradition there was a possibility to like police or control things like that. Because after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu departed, the Goswamis were in Vrindavan and then there were some followers in Bengal, some followers in Orissa. So even the Kirtan style... Sorry, let me just... Disagree. I disagree. Anyway, go on. Okay. So the Kirtan styles that evolved were slightly different and there there was a broad understanding. My, My point is that is it did it ever happen in the Gaudiya tradition or even in the broad Vedic tradition? India itself is so big that somebody could actually monitor and police exactly who is doing what where. So Prabhupada talked about Falena Parichayate that, in fact, as you said, Prabhupada was opposed by Bhakti Sanskrit. Many of, many of his god brothers when he tried to preach. And Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur was opposed by some of the followers of Bhakti Nath Thakur. Bhakti Nath Thakur was opposed by many of those who were considered Gaudiya Vaishnavas at their time the Gaudiya Vishnu orthodoxy at that time. So it is to some extent different, uh, like Prabhupada talked about experimenting, that different devotees will try different things and some things will work in terms of attracting people to core Krishna consciousness. Some may not work. So is it possible in advance to actually mandate that this should not be done? Are there any precedents to that in the tradition itself? Well, uh, we can go back to Rup Kaviraj, who was rejected. That was very, very early in the Sampradaya. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, even you're saying in the Vedic tradition, there's no policing, but uh, Buddhism was rejected. Jainism was rejected as being non-Vedic. In the Mahabharat, we have, who was that? There was, uh, oh, there were two instances. There was one where, one Rishi, he, he preached atheism in yeah. to Yudhishthira. Who was that? I can't remember his name. There's and then Jabali he said, in the Ramayana, Jabali in the Ramayana, in yeah, in the Mahabharat. And and then afterwards, he and Krishna rebuked him. And afterwards, he said, "No, no, I was just doing it for a purpose." And there was another one, whose name I don't remember, who was just speaking outright atheism, and he was rejected by everyone. Atheism in the sense of being against the, set, the teachings, uh, uh, accepting the Vedas. Mm. There was one saying there's no karma when you die, it's all over. Yeah. Like this. I, I don't remember exactly. Um, so that always has, there's always been a sense of orthodoxy of what is right and what is wrong. 
Rup Kavi, like I said, I gave the example of Rup Kaviraj was rejected. No, I think this, these are, sorry to interrupt you, these are like Buddhism and Jainism, they are, in, to some extent, uh, they themselves define themselves in contradiction to the Vedic tradition. So whether the Vedic tradition rejected them or not, they themselves okay, define themselves differently. But that's now, Rupa good, Kamiraj, yeah. again, I think the issue goes to, I'm not saying that there can be no moral policing or no sort of jurisdiction or, pol or regulation. But my point is that uh, if as a movement, we start, uh, you earlier talked about the word micro aggression, but the other opposite would be micro control. Because mm. we cannot micro control our members. Maybe it was possible when everybody was living in the temples, but now we are largely a congregation based movement. So to some extent, if through discussions like these, some broad principles are understood, then future generations of devotees, they can adopt those principles. Because in general, in our movement, I don't know, as, the move, as, the, as we are spreading, how much control we can ever have on anyone. Especially when people are having their own, their own lives and their own careers and they're not really living in temples. So rather than sort of defining a path, this is the path to go. If we can help people develop their inner compass, then they will know the direction to go in. Now, I'm not saying we don't have a path, but the fact that we are ourselves in uncharted territory now, and uh, in many ways, the world has changed as compared to a few, uh, few decades ago, what to speak a few centuries ago. So how much is it possible to clearly define this is what Prabhupada wanted and anything different from this is, uh, is going to be is wrong. Because over that itself, we will end up having debates. So if you could give broad principles rather than specifics, wouldn't that... Well, what, what it'll come down to is, uh, as it has throughout the generations in all Vedic and even Buddhist sampradayas, uh, is Guru Vachan. Okay. Guru says this, this is how we understand Prabhupada. And... Those who want, they follow, and those who don't, they, they prefer someone else's interpretation. That's what. It, that's how I see it's going to come down practically. I think it's going to be very, very, as time goes on, it's going to be more and more difficult to try to impose some orthopraxis on the whole of ISKCON, as you say. Yeah. But Guru Vachan should be enough. That's so, so by here, Guru Vachan, you are referring to Shila Prabhupada's that, words or the Vachan? No, I know. I'm saying guru. individual gurus will okay. say, this is how we're following Srila Prabhupada. Okay. Yeah. And it, it may be different to others. Yeah. I'm talking about orthopraxis. I'm just reviewing a book that Jayadvaita Maharaj asked me to go through on Kirtan standards and that Prabhupada clearly gave, but it seems impossible to me that we can ever get back to that. Yes. And unless we have a unless we have a sea change within the whole movement about what the Kirtan standard should be, because it might be possible, but uh one challenge it's difficult to go back. Yeah. So uh the so one challenge would so, be that he does quote me in that book as saying in, in the temple, well, he specifically mentions this one in Salem in South India, where they sing the, the Mongol Arti in the tune that Srila Prabhupada wanted, which, mm. which is rare in the whole movement. Um, oh, okay. so, so what I'm saying, yeah, that because I happen to be the guru overseeing the devotees there, and I say it should be done like this, they do it like that. But if you go somewhere else, they might not uh, say, well, you know, whatever. <laughs> so it, it's, we can, th there's an example of um, differences of approach, largely according to, most followers are not going to think about things even as deeply as you and I are discussing now. And we're, we're really only touching the surface, as you know. Yes, but uh, most followers want to f want to follow. Hmm. They don't, they don't like you're saying. Most of nowadays are, are uh, their what are they called congregation followers. They have their job. They have their families. They don't have 
they don't have time and maybe not the inclination to get into all kinds of abstruse issues. They want to come to the temple and chant Hare Krishna and hear about Krishna. Hmm. And someone appeals to them. It, it, it's, it's not totally non-philosophical, but it, it appeals to their heart. And they say, yeah, I want to be part of this. They don't think about all the, the different issues and this and that. And they, they, and actually, that's one of the things that the guru does. He's supposed to learn from his guru, learn from shastra, learn from tradition, and he represents that to his disciples because you can't you can't individually study all the teachings of the even to study everything Srila Prabhupada gave. I mean, it's 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 so vast and so deep. So practically, the disciples they rely on the gurus to to represent Prabhupada for them, and there are going to be differences in outlook and uh, how to negotiate that. The Catholic Church yes, does a pretty good job, I guess, by having different uh, orders, orders yes, and ma'am. what do they call that? Different rites. But they've had splits also, haven't they? Yes, Maharaj. And... But, they're, but they're not doing too... too uh, they're not doing too bad in the sense of keeping all different... different outlooks together. Yes, Maharaj. I've heard it said that, that Srila Prabhupada said we should study the Catholic Church for their organization and everything. It's a, it's very that's very much a top down movement, isn't it? As opposed to the Protestant churches, which are supposed to be me and God, me and Jesus. Yes. Right. The original Ritvikism. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that is true. So, so I'm what sure. what I'm saying is that I think the, the the gurus by their examples, even if the gurus don't. I gave the example of Mahavishnu Maharaj. I, mean, I hope Mah Mahavishnu Maharaj doesn't mind me giving this example. I, I, I think he won't because he knows that you know, I have all great love and respect for him. I don't think he's made a, a very deep philosophical analysis about why he dresses the way he does and his, you could say, zany style. But he does it and it has its effects. You may you could say it's not grave enough, but many people seem to appreciate it. So, mm. do you need to do you need to make a big philosophical analysis of what should be done and what not should be? Done? <laughs> yeah. The house the house is on fire. So should we? Th yeah, that is one major consideration. Let's sit down. Let's yeah. sit down and discuss it. <laughs> Yeah, that is something which is which is also quite a big issue, especially in the West, because our movement is is uh, is almost dying out with respect to Westerners. Recently, one devotee wrote a. He said, "By nineteen, by twenty forty, twenty fifty, we might be writing the obituary of the last Western devotee in Iskon, because we are attracting Indians." But now it may not happen. But that is a. I don't think. No, but that, that, but I think that is. If, if you can make projections like that, but I, no. I prefer to listen to Lord Chaitanya. Priti vite ache jato nagaradi gram prasavacha pratahi by morna. It's time for another Hari Krishna revolution. Anyway, go on saying yes, what you're saying. So well, I don't, I don't agree with it. Okay, no, thank you. Satyam so, eva jayate. Yes, Maharaj. So, so two things you later meant about mentioned the point earlier mentioned the point about sensitivity. So I I have been spending an instruction of my spiritual master a lot of time in the West, especially in America, over the last four or five years. And I try to understand where people are coming from. So I noticed two, two different things. Yes, there is always the possibility that we become so sensitive that we, we don't speak the truth. But there is also the other thing that sometimes uh, there are some aspects about our presentation or about prioritization of our philosophical presentations that alienates people and then it doesn't let them come to our core teachings. So in that sense, my understanding is 
sensitization and is at least we need an awareness of what is going to affect people to what degree then after that we can decide is this a important enough teaching for me to speak right now at this place to this person and if it is then th- then we can speak it but if it is not if you are not just aware of it and something which uh, prevents people from from even understanding the core principles of krishna consciousness because of certain certain incidental statements like prabhupad that particular conversation which you quoted with jamadagni you know why are you focusing on that he had so many bodyguards there is so many other so much other wisdom in the bhagavatam why not focus on that so my concern is more that if we are not aware of how people perceive us then we may alienate them by by peripheral points and actually be committing violence to them by not giving them the even the opportunity to hear the core points so that of course so i would say both dangers are there one is we become so sensitive that we never speak the core points but the other is that we become so you could say insensitive or unmindful of how our audience is perceiving us that the peripheral points of our presentation alienate them from the core points and they never get to hear those <laughs> while you were saying that i was thinking of of shila propad in america in 1966 giving his classes about how arjuna should krishna was telling arjuna you're a fool because you don't want to fight and this is at the height of the anti vietnam war protests and shila propad was talking against illicit sex and against taking drugs Phew. He got away with it. <laughs> yeah, that is you know one thing is social media has made things much worse now where really, any really, yeah. any part can be extracted from anywhere and put together. So yeah. that is the challenge. So what you said earlier also that it's it's amazing how Prabhupad didn't get too much of a vehement opposition despite his strong statements on many issues. Mm-hmm. Well no but not only did he not get opposition but the people who are coming to him were were hippies who believed in free sex and drugs and no war and shila prabhupad was strongly against these things and he still managed to take people out and make devotees that's really amazing are there some examples which you would like to discuss about how prabhupad uh, adapted according to his time place circumstance what he learned from bhakti dasa thakur i think you read that you in your passage you read that uh, while prabhupad did some ins- essential changes for some co- some significant changes for not essential changes but changes that were essential for spreading krishna consciousness and so can we discuss some examples of that from which we can learn about some principles of change and continuity in the tradition Oh well that comes there's a long section on that in the book about uh, Shila Prabhupada's what one scholar called his religious gradualism okay gradualism gradualism yeah how Shila Prabhupada and 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 different scholars um Hari Shari Prabhu quotes one in his uh, transcendental diary that he read to Shila Prabhupada how one scholar had seen different phases in shila prabhupad's activities and prabhupad appreciated that and um satsarup maharaj in his prabhupad lelamita he traces out three major three major phases of shila prabhupad's preaching in the west the initial phase when it was very small he was much more accessible hmm and then it changed as as he became a dynamic well he was always dynamic but a, a worldwide leader and he couldn't keep in he couldn't keep in touch with uh, all his disciples and then the, the third one he was he was revealing i i, I can't remember exactly i should i should have the whole this <laughs> of the whole thing here but it was uh, he had very big plans for changing the world that was there even at the beginning so there were phases in his activities and definitely at the beginning um he gave initiation that's one example he gave initiation very easily 
I cite one anecdote of someone who in San Francisco in 1969, especially Prabhupada was very liberal in giving initiation. But, um, but then later, within quite a short time, actually, he, he became more strict about that. Um, with marriage in the beginning, he was encouraging that. But after some time, without discouraging marriage, he, he actually used the word disgusted because he became so fed up of so many marriages breaking up and he didn't want to be involved in it at all. Uh, and then he started emphasizing Varnashra more and more. It's not just for the whole world, but it's for our own devotees also, because so many of them in the West especially fail to hmm. maintain their vows. Um, so, Maharaj, so the, sorry to, so did how was Bhaktisan Sutakur's uh, role with respect to uh, arranging marriages or giving initiation? He had nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with marriage. He, he was very, in that sense, he was very strict as a sannyasi. He would even, um, when he was giving initiation to women, he would, he would, Harinam, he would give chant on the beads in the room. The woman would wait outside and he'd have someone else go and give the beads to her. Oh, Okay. That I came across recently. Um, and uh, and we, we know from uh, OBL Kapoor that when, when Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur gave Harinam to OBL Kapoor's wife, he did so from behind a screen, which was quite common in those days, that mm. there, was, there would be a, in, in an assembly, just like a religious assembly, There'd be a screen between the men and the women. Okay. That was, was there, a common that was, was a common there thing. Was classes also or a specific mm -hmm. session? Not that I know of. Not okay. that I know of. But I, at the same time, we don't find that. I, I never thought of that, actually. But um, um, we don't hear so much of people, even women coming to listen to the classes. And there were educated women at that time, but the number was, the percentage was much fewer than at the present time. Okay. So in one sense, we could also say that during Bhaktisana Sri Thakur's time, the social structure was still quite uh, existing and it was quite conducive for spiritual growth. So he didn't have to intervene in that. Well, he was, he was more... Uh, what nowadays they were called like a male chauvinist than, than, than was the current of, of course, when we say the current of the times, the zeitgeist, it was very confused in India with, with movements like the Arya Samaj wanting to get back to what they think is the original Vedic course. But this John Sarasvart Thakur is very much against what we would nowadays call feminism. Uh, I'll give an example that um, Bhaktisthan Sarasar Thakur was the secretary for the Navadvip Dham Pracharani Sabha at the time of Bhaktivinoda Thakur and even afterward for some time. Um, now, in, the, the, in one of the Sajana Toshani magazines, there was a report on the minutes from the meeting of the Navadvip Dham Pracharani Sabha Hmm. and which were written by Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati. There was a greed of come by everyone. And the last one was that, I can't remember exactly the words, but it was something like that. A shabhai kono strigon to kono pod nita parvena. Something like this. I'm, I'm saying it in Bengali because no woman can have any pad within this organization. So pad can mean position, it can mean in the same way as having a post or it can mean just membership also. It wasn't clear to me what it meant. But anyway, you get the gist. It was a, mm. it was a point that they all made, no women can have any position. Which suggests that uh, there was that, that was coming, that women were taking positions in society at that time. They were beginning to do so. Hmm. 
He did so, have female disciples. Yeah. Of course, and he made that uh, Vishnu Priya Pali. That was quite an amazing thing for women who couldn't practice bhakti at home. I, d I don't know what kind of, whether it was older women, widows, or even women of uh, childbearing age uh, who left their families. That, that would be, there would be a huge uproar if he, if he took out women from their families when they were still in the role of mothers with young children. So I, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Mm. Which kind of women joined at the Vishnu Priya Pali? I, as far as I understand, it was never a very big thing, not that there were very many. Yes, Maharaj. And that's closed down now, as you probably know. Yeah, that's true. Yes, Maharaj. So the, so the point which I've, uh, I was trying to understand is that, you know, like you, you said, Prabhupada was, uh, Prabhupada was involved in marriages and then he decided to not be involved. Bhaktisana Sudhakur was not much involved in marriages at all. Because no, no, not at all. No, not no, at all. No. So I was making the point that maybe that was not so much a, either male chauvinism, what people might call a male chauvinism or feminism. Maybe it was because he, it was in India at that time that devote people, there was to some extent Indian culture was there and marriages would be arranged. In one sense, when Prabhupada came to the West, his disciples were almost completely uh, taken out of the parent culture. And even in the parent culture, there were not really sound arrangements for marriage. So to some extent, it was more like a social responsibility that Prabhupada had to take, whereas that was not required for Bhaktisan Sri Thakur. Could it be also like that? Right. Okay. I get your point. Yeah. 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 But at the same time, I was saying some things about Srila Prabhupada I find very difficult to understand because Srila Prabhupada, right from the very beginning, I, it must have been the... That must have been the first marriage he arranged in Iskon in the West. That was between Mukunda and Janaki. Yes. Who were already living together as boyfriend and girlfriend, and he got them initiated. Then after that, just after that, he got them married. Um, but Srila Prabhupada said to Janaki that the, the, the wife, she's, uh, she's the head of the home. And she has her jurisdiction within the home. And he he had them in, he had her dress in a sari, and he tied the sari to Mukunda's dhoti and said, Now you for seven days you have to be tied up together. And it seems that Prabhupada, even with his very, very new, maybe they they were, yeah, they would call themselves the followers, but they really didn't know what it meant to be a disciple. And they really didn't know hardly anything about Krishna consciousness. But he expected them, it seems like that, he expected to just adopt to this culture just like that. And which is why I say that uh, I keep on making the point that later Srila Prabhupada became more and more insisted on Varnashram, seeing that. And he, he wrote about that. That's one of the most quoted quotes of Srila Prabhupada, that people cannot change their culture overnight. Therefore, we have a policy of engaging the boys and the girls equally. Hmm. But it seems that in the beginning, and again, we, ha we have to be very careful to try to psychoanalyze the mind of an Acharya, but it seems that Srila Prabhupada had higher expectations of his earlier disciples than was later seen to that, that, they, that they could live up to that. And that in itself is, you know, it's a very big discussion. And at the same time, Srila Prabhupada said that you, you, have, you were all devotees in your last life and Krishna sent. So hmm. <laughs> there's so many things to consider. That's uh, true, Maharaj. So, just uh, this point about uh, Prabhupada, in one sense, uh, what you said about uh, having cu particular cultural expectations, and at the same time saying that you can't send, change culture overnight. Well, I, he he wrote yeah. that about you can't change the culture overnight. That must have been around 1974 when he was making his Chaitanya Charitamrita commentary. Yes, Maharaj. So, He'd been through a lot. Yeah. In the eight years or so. Before he wrote that, yeah, mm. it does. Sorry, sorry yeah, it does seem that he was quite uh, 
uh, you could say inclusive in engaging women in various services say for the very idea that uh, a single woman can go out and approach a unfamiliar man to distribute a book but that itself would have been quite uh, anathema it would have been quite outrageous in say traditional indian culture if, uh, maybe a few centuries a few decades ago also so it so to some extent uh is a person's nature like i say a woman's nature is it just determined only by the fact that they have a female female body or is it also determined by the kind of upbringing they have had Whoa. so so no i mean the question i'm making is that did prabhupad in one sense accommodate people according to the way they could be engaged in krishna service yeah And, yeah um yeah uh One thing we we have to understand also, if we're trying to understand Sri Prabhupada's Buddha mission, is that he saw what he was doing in the West as an emergency. He used that word emergency, especially for the um, in the matter of making Westerners into Brahmanas. He used the term emergency, and he also used the example of when the house is on fire, and he used that for. communication somehow or other you communicate but uh he wanted to preach krishna conscious by any means and the, the women can distribute books great he was into it but uh he he promoted that he was very happy with that now there is a significant statement that shila prop that well um Kulandri Prabhu at New Vrindavan said that Srila Prabhupada said to him, and although it's not in the Veda base with a recording of Prabhupada, I think we can take it as authentic. Uh, Srila Prabhupada, he spoke to Kulandri about the future and farms. And we know, of course, Srila Prabhupada also said, said to Rameshwara Swami at the time that millions will join our farms, that Srila Prabhupada saw a very different future second phase of the movement from the monastic let's get out there we got to change the world and and then when the world is changed you can't live all that your whole life and develop a society on the basis of being in a constant state of emergency shila prabhat had a vision for varnashram so he definitely engaged the women in various ways at the time but his his basic role model for women was as you say according to indian culture but exactly according to shastra which is to follow sri dharma mm. ajay isn't here uh, like a we are uh, like I mean, analyzing Prabhupada's statements from a particular hermeneutic, where say his these are statements for emergency phase, and these are statements for a later phase, and who is going to decide right now whether our movement is in the emergency phase or the later phase? It Because, should be both. It should be both. <clears throat> the emergency is still there. The Western, <clears throat> the Western world is. significantly more crazy than it was when shila prabhad was here yeah. so th- that's that's something which i feel in the whole gender issue which is splitting its gone it seems to be it, it uh, this I, i i i don't think that both sides have come together really and really try to understand it this very deeply I, anyway i don't want to get into the politics of it all but we have an emergency situation but at the same time we should make a start by now we should have well progressed in establishing the the stable situation so part a major part of our preaching is showing stable vaishnav communities which have their social system which is hierarchical and men have their roles to play as brahmana kshatriya vaishyas and shudras and women have their role to play supporting and everyone chants hari krishna together but there are different social roles so that's also one kind of preaching to show an alternative society that works 
compared to the madness of the present world, which it, it doesn't work. It doesn't make people happy, even materially. Economically, it's a mess. And uh, we're supposed to show, so on, on the one hand, we need men, women, robots. Maybe you can have some program a robot to go and do book distribution. Hey, how about that? <laughs> hey, that's a great your idea. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to yeah. take the patent. I'm going to take the patent for that one. <laughs> maybe the maybe the robots can distribute to robots also. <laughs> what do you need humans? What do you need humans for anymore? We got robots, right? Anyway, Prabhupada, mm. he, he so it's a, and it's still an emergency. Mm. But so we need both things going on side by side. Mm. It's not one or the other. We need both things going on side by side. That's what I see. We need to have our farms showing Varnashram Dharma, depending on the land, the cows, and Krishna. But we also need to recruit everyone who can to go out and spread the message. So the 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 social needs and the way we preach to people are going to be different. Yes, Maharaj. And, you know, in one sense, uh, socially applying spiritual principles, it is a huge challenge. Because if we look at the track record of our movement, probably the biggest desire, disasters have been associated with uh, a social application, whether it's the Gurukul, which led to the child abuse, which really has a devastating effect. Fortunate it was not as devastating as it could have been. Then we had like the farm community in New Vrindavan, which just completely went off, off the rails. So to some, in some extent, trying to... And apply... there's, there's the uh, well-documented uh, attitudes toward women, which, which uh, abuse of women. That's yeah. also, that's the social thing. Although I must say that... Uh, Pretty much everyone got maltreated. <laughs> it was a pretty, it was pretty rough in some ways. Okay, go on. Mm. So, so uh, in, the, in that sense. Oh, I, another thing is not just this the social disasters, but the guru fall downs, and and yeah, that that's also been a major factor in the, uh, the Hare Krishna implosion in the West. Implosion. That's a mm. very, yeah, it's a very profound. Uh, pop- I would say a very apt word to describe what has happened. Yeah, that's true. So, so in one sense, addressing social issues through some, through any means, that is a very complex and in one sense, some situation specific thing. Because yeah. although we can say there is a concrete, so Prabhupada had a, even if we agree, uh, even if we accept that Prabhupada had a very concrete social vision, even Prabhupada did not give the specifics of that vision very he wanted Varanashram, but mm. how exactly Varanashram is to be implemented? Prabhupada talked, okay, there should be the Brahmana should have these qualities, uh, these people should have these qualities like that. So how to go about implementing that, that is itself a challenge. And in one sense, even for those who, who are advocating Varanashram, there are quite a few differences of vision about how Varanashram is to be implemented in, in the movement or in our farm communities associated with the movement also. Well, I'm glad there are different people who have different opinions because I, I hardly find anyone who's even thinking about it. So if there are different opinions, that means at least there, there are different people thinking about it. Oh, okay. It's just like uh, mm. I, came a, I came across a statement recently about one of our leaders was saying how uh, we, have to, we have to be careful that people in the West don't think that we're a cult. And I thought, I, I thought it'd be great if they thought we were a cult. At least they'd be thinking about us. They don't even, they don't even know we exist. <laughs> okay. At least if they think we're a cult, they start to think we can start to discuss with them, but they don't even know we exist. So, <laughs> I don't know, Krishna. Interesting way of looking at it. Yeah. yeah. To some extent, we have definitely dropped out of the public awareness in the Western world. Isn't it amazing? We were so much in the public. We were so prominent and there weren't that many of us. Yeah. We were so dynamic. 
That's true. So it's, I think it's from one, 19... one, ma one, one major reason for that was that we used to go on Harinam, and that, that in itself is massive publicity because people notice us. <laughs> they really notice us when we mm. go and a whole bunch of people, all of a sudden you're just in the shopping mall, all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of people with all these different colored dresses and, and jumping up and down and making these bang, bang, bang. And hey, they're happy. That's really, that's really unusual. Mm. <laughs> so it, it, people notice it. I and mean, you know, the people come and everyone's taking photos and nowadays videos and doing selfies and all that kind of thing. But it's, so people definitely noticed us and the book distribution, people noticed us. So uh, that's good advertisement, just to just to do the basic core activities of preaching, public yeah. harinam and uh, book distribution, and of course festivals and prasad distribution, and there are so many things to do. TV preaching, but these two things are really they really notice us. Yeah, it almost seems as if as our movement went down in the West, it started growing in India. Because even during Prabhupada's times, there are a lot of people who became life members, but not many became committed followers. Yeah, but I tell you what, just at the time Prabhupada was leaving, was a time when Prabhupada was just getting noticed by prominent people, just like your uh, Nathji, Srinathji, and the people like that, really prominent people. And in the government, people, would, if Prabhupada had stayed a few more years, he would have been heralded. Big people were coming to him, and they were no, they were just getting convinced. The opening of the Vrindavan temple, that was a major thing. And then the Bombay temple was about to be opened, and people were visiting, and they're seeing there's this fabulous temple coming up. And but they're even more struck. You know that was in the story of your uh, Mahaprabhu. He mm -hmm. often told that story. He was. It really fascinated educated Indians like himself who were not interested in religion or Hinduism. They were just amazed by seeing these Western people living and know and not living Christian consciousness and knowing the philosophy. And it really had an impression and good a good class of people were coming. And they continued to come actually even after but uh, one disaster happened. Even in Vrindavan, there are so many people like Guptas and you know, merchants. They were coming to Kirtanananda for initiation. It, it, Vrindavan, I, I, this is again, it's unpleasant history. But if Kirtananda, if he stayed what he seemed, people had faith in him. And they were becoming his disciples. And there was... I, I, Big people were coming to him, and it, and the movement would have been different. Again, the, the guru fall down thing, it did have its effect in India also, especially, oh, it's a complex history, but how do we get to that? Yeah, no, I was saying that it's almost, a, sorry, it was as if, as our movement went down in the West, it started growing in India. So you're saying yeah, that, yeah. in one sense, the momentum had been set up by yeah, yeah. Prabhupada's presence, and then yeah, the yeah. momentum was built. Indian devotees were beginning to join as brahmacharis also, which had hardly happened previously. Mm -hmm. They were joining in numbers. Yes, Maharaj. It seems and I, actually they were. There were so many in Mayapur. I was in Mayapur when Srila Prabhupada passed away, and um, there were so many young Bengali brahmacharis, and then they were initiated by uh, first batch was initiated by Bhavananda, and then. And, you know, like this. Yes, Maharaj. So, the overall point I was making is that it seems in India our movement is growing. Of course, we could grow yeah. much, much more, but it is growing significantly. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm. Yeah, it's, okay. it's an Indian headship. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Indian headship. Yeah. Sorry. So. <laughs> so. So, in one sense, we can say that. Uh, there are some things which we are doing right because of which we are growing. If we can say Falena Parichayate as a criteria. And uh, so can we also say that the cultural context make a big difference? Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah so, and also, yeah, yeah. And people, uh, the, the 
people are born in India for a reason, right? They have a background piety, hmm. inclination toward Krishna consciousness. But then, Bharata Bhumite Hoyla Manusha Janma Ja Janma Shatam Kari Paro Kara Paro Upaka Prabhupada quoted this so many times. He so many times he said he wanted Indians to now you Indians go and save the West. Mm. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. And even uh, I was recently there was one conversation with Srila Prabhupada in Tehran and he met some Indians for the first time and he was preaching to them. You should be your India. He quoted this verse. You should become gurus. Mm. People yes, he saw for the first time. Amazing. It's almost like he was doing what Bhakti Sri Thakur did with him in the first meeting. Right. Yeah. Yes, Maharaj. So Maharaj, I was making this. I, I, I like you said, the, the, there's the Hare Krishna implosion in the West. But I think it's it can come up and I, we have to look to India. Yes, Maharaj. Let so, the India. Yes, Maharaj. Spread so, Krishna consciousness around the world again. Yes, yes, Maharaj. So the the point I was trying to make through this is that that the one uh, that uh, could it be that the way we are presenting Krishna consciousness, it uh, it appeals to people who have grown up in a hierarchical society. Largely, India still is hierarchical, although it's changing. But as society becomes less and less hierarchical. The way we present Krishna consciousness stops resonating with people. It starts. Uh, so, although we can say that Prabhupada approached people and he spoke very strongly, and people accepted at that time, like four regulatory principles and chanting. But to some extent, even Prabhupada's disciples at those times, the people who came, they they also had grown up at least to some extent in the hierarchical society. The post World War. They knew about, they just had experience with bad authorities. That's true. That's true. They but had experience now, today, authority, 2010, yeah. 2020, there is leave alone bad authority. There is, there is no authority, practically speaking. So well, in, I, don't, I don't think so. No, people, I, I don't like to, people like to think like that, but actually there is. Yeah, go on. No, of course. I mean, if you could say left liberal, the leftists, they are themselves authorities and they do moral policing and cancelling of others. Yeah. So in mm. principle, authority can never be rejected. Some authority will be there, of course. Mm. But the point I was making is that a hierarchical presentation of Krishna consciousness appeals to people who have grown up in a hierarchical culture. And when the culture itself becomes highly egalitarian, then the, the hierarchy itself jars people with so many negative memories and negative stimuli that it alienates them. So, yeah, but it may be that people and the, the, they're looking for direction because they're. they're that, that could have the effect also if people, uh, the, 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 there's the, there's no one to lead them. And then we have the the uh, only he could lead them is the title of one of the volumes of the Prabhupada Leilamrita. The effect could, it have, could have the effect of someone. And, and that happens socially also. We see that people become less and more and more egalitarian and then they want a big leader. It swings, doesn't it? It's like the swing between what uh, materialism and romanticism, and then you have you have egalitarianism and liberalism, and then people want a strong leader who can take charge and lead the way, and it's like a swing goes on. But Krishna consciousness has to be hierarchical because uh, you have to have gurus, and if there's an organization, there has to be a hierarchy, and God's at the top. Of course. So usually toward the end, I try to summarize, if I can do that in a couple of minutes. Okay, we were all over the place, thanks yes, to me. Ma okay, no, no, Aris. it is a, it's a difficult subject. So broadly, we try to discuss the topic of change and con continuity in the Gaudiya tradition, mm -hmm. with the focus on Shri Prabhupada and Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur. And then in trying to, so you read from your article. Which on I, only got, I only got about 35% uh, of the way through. Yes, Maharaj. So you discussed the point that in that article that, that there can be, the first point you mentioned that this is not an abstract discussion because it matters in today's world because how are we going to go ahead? And we are, we have this immense responsibility of carrying on the mission of these great Acharyas who practically change the course of world history, world religious history at least. So, uh, so we try to draw some guidelines and you mentioned that that there is no that in personalities in uh, folk in at outlooks there can be difference in acharyas, and then 
I mentioned that so Prabhupada didn't change in the essential message, but there is a difference. And then with respect to so I discussed like social issues. Bhakti Nath Thakur was against child marriage, but Prabhupada had slightly different stand. So then I mentioned, can we say that social stands are a little more contextual according to Acharya? So you said Prabhupada also yeah. had a very concrete social vision. Even with Bhakti Vinod, I mean, I should qualify that. At least superficially, he seemed to be against child marriage. Okay, superficial. Oh, okay go on. Yeah. Okay, sorry. At least so, superficial. So, so, so then you mentioned that because Prabhupada is a founder Acharya and he did seem to have a concrete social vision. So we cannot simply separate like that. That doesn't mean we freeze our moment in time. But at the same time, that doesn't mean we neglect Prabhupada's guidelines. We have to have that balance between fidelity and uh, fl- sorry, fidelity and relevance. And then we discussed two, three issues. One issue which kept coming up was feminism. And the other issue was, of course, of... Uh, so, uh, so with respect to... I, I was mostly using feminism to demonstrate various yeah. points. Yeah, yeah the, the, the point which I think we were, you were mentioning using feminism to discuss the point that how the world has radically changed and there is a lot of craziness in the Western world now. So Prabhupada was able to speak strongly and still he was able to relate, reach to a lot of people. But in today's world, we have the danger of becoming hypersensitive and not speaking our message also. But at the same time, so we discussed this point of when we are following Prabhupada, at one level, different devotees will do different things. And ultimately, it may come down to the Guru Vachan. So something like the Catholic Church has got orders. But, but by our discussions like this, we can try to come to some broad principles. And one, one principle which you tried to discuss was that, that with respect to Prabhupada wanting, there's a first phase of emergency, second phase of uh, more of return to the tradition of an ashram. So we can say that right now in our movement, both phases are still there. So both may need to go in parallel. And to some extent in the West, it's more of an emergency mode. Whereas in India, our movement is flourishing. And you mentioned that Prabhupada set up the momentum and the, and the next generations have built on that. And that's how, in one sense, it's the responsibility of India and Indians to show the way for the rest of the world to become Krishna conscious. Of course, there are many other points. But is there anything concluding you would like to say, Maharaj? Many things, but I won't because I want to try and guide train and go to Arati. <laughs> okay, Maharaj. <laughs> Thank you very much for your sharing your wisdom and sparing your time, Maharaj. I look forward to your association again in future. Where we can okay, Jai. Further. Thank you. Hari Hari Bao.